1 Kings chapter 13. This passage can be one of the more um, difficult passages to read. It seems like it's unfair, like something's not exactly right about this story. But within the story, God's perfect wisdom is seen, and God's um, justice is very clearly seen in 1 Kings chapter 13. But in order to understand 1 Kings 13, we must get the context from chapter 12. Um, in chapter 12, I'm going to start reading in verse 26. And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now shall the kingdom return to the house of David, if this people go up to do sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then shall the heart of this people turn again unto their Lord, even unto Rehoboam, king of Judah. And they shall kill me, and go again to Rehoboam, the king of Judah. Whereupon the king took counsel, and made two calves of gold, and said unto them, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And he set the one in Bethel, and he, the other put he in Dan. And this thing became a sin for the people, went to worship before the one even unto Dan. And he made a house of the high places, and made priests of the lowest of the people, which were not of the sons of Levi. And Jeroboam ordained a feast in the eighth month, the fifteenth day of the month, like unto the feast that is in Judah. And he offered upon the altar... So did he in Bethel, sacrificing unto the calves that uh, he made. And he placed uh, in Bethel the priests of the high places which he had made. So he offered upon the altar which he had made in Bethel the fifteenth day of the eighth month, even in the month which he had devised of his own heart, and ordained a feast unto the children of Israel. And he offered upon the altar, uh, offered upon the altar and burnt incense." Now this is right after Jeroboam's revolt, which was ordained by God against Rehoboam because of the sins of Solomon. But Jeroboam revolted against God, saying, I'm going to give you this kingdom, saying, well, what if the people go back to Jerusalem? They're going to go and worship God and see Rehoboam, and they're going to leave me, and then they're going to kill me. So how can I keep my place? So he devised these calves of gold. In that context, the very first time coming up, this was the eighth month, uh, the 15th day. In the seventh month, the 15th day of the seventh month, was the Feast of Booths, or the Feast of Tabernacle. So he specifically chose one month later to have this big kind of like opening ceremony for these altars. And so as the people are coming to worship before these altars, God sends a man up. In, verse, in chapter 13, verse 1, as he's doing his first kind of opening ceremony, ceremony of this. And behold, there came a man of God out of Judah by the word of the Lord unto Bethel. And Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. And he cried against the altar in the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus saith the Lord, behold, a child shall be born unto the house of David, Josiah by name, and upon thee shall he offer the priests of the high places that burn incense upon thee and men's bones shall be burnt upon thee. And he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign which the Lord hath spoken. Behold, the altar shall be rent, and the ashes that are upon it shall be poured out. Every time God speaks, his word comes true. It's always true, and it always comes to pass. We see these prophecies fulfilled um, in First Kings 13, verse 5. If you go down to verse 5, it says, The altar also was rent, the ashes poured out from the altar according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. And in 2 Kings um, 23, 16, where Josiah um, is king, this prophecy is fulfilled. 23, 16 says, And as Josiah turned himself, he spied the sepulchers that were there in the mount, and he sent and took the bones out of the sepulchers, and burned them upon the altar, and polluted it, according to the word of the Lord, which the man of God proclaimed, who proclaimed these words. Every time God speaks, his word comes true. God's word also can never be stopped by human devices. No matter what man tries to do to keep God's word from coming to pass, it always happens. You see, Jeroboam 
in verse 4 saying, And it came to pass when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God, which he cried against the altar in Bethel, that he put forth his hand from the altar, saying, Lay hold on him. And his hand which he put forth against him dried up so that he could not pull it in again to him. I don't fully know what it looked like, but I have a feeling he was sitting like this and wasn't able to pull it back in again. And I'm pretty confident that his men decided, I'm not going to go touch that guy. <laughs> you even see Jeroboam asking for the man to pray for him, saying, okay, okay, maybe you were right. I probably shouldn't have done this. Um, and you see verse 6. And the king answered and said unto the man of God, Entreat now the face of the Lord thy God, and pray for me, that my hand may be restored me again. And the man of God besought the Lord, and the king's hand was restored him again, and became as it was before. Jeroboam got a very clear picture of the fact that he was going directly against God. And it was very clear who God was. But yet, we see through his life, he chose to fully go against the word of God, even though it was picture clear, clear for him. Additionally, God's word must be followed. People will often test our commitments to following God and his word. So look down in verse 7. And the king said unto the man of God, Come home with me and refresh thyself, and I will give thee a reward. Which is kind of funny, because he just said... The man of God just spoke against what Jeroboam has set up for worship, has just been the cause for his hand withering, and now he's saying, come into my house, I'm going to give you a reward. I'm going to, you know, be a friend to you, which is kind of interesting considering that he has no repentance for his sin at all there. He's not sorry for what he's done. He's just saying, okay, let's move on with life. Um, but the man of God says, and the man of God said unto the king, if thou wilt give me half thine house, half of your kingdom, I will not go in with thee. Neither will I eat bread nor drink water in this place. For so was it charged me by the word of the Lord, saying, Eat no bread, nor drink water, nor turn again by the same way that thou camest. So he went another way and returned not by the way that he came to Bethel. This was the man of God's first test. Sometimes it's easy when somebody's blatantly trying to convince you to sin. That it's like, no, I'm not going to do that. That's foolish, utter foolishness. Um, but we see the man of God gets a second test, kind of. In verse 11, Now there dwelt an old prophet in Bethel, and his sons came and told him all the works that the man of God had done that day in Bethel. The words which he had spoken unto the king, them they told also to their father. And their father said unto him, which way went he? For his sons had seen what way the man of God went, which came from Judah. And he said unto his sons, Saddle me the ass. So they saddled him the ass, and he rode thereon, and went after the man of God, and found him sitting under an oak. And he said unto him, Art thou the man of God that camest from Judah? And he said, I am. Then he said unto him, Come home with me, and eat bread. And he said, The man of God said, I may not return with thee, nor go in with thee, neither will I eat bread, nor drink water with thee in this place. For it was said to me by the word of the Lord, Thou shalt eat no bread, nor drink water there, nor turn again to go by the way that thou uh, camest. And the prophet saying, He said unto him, I am a prophet also as thou art. And an angel spoke unto me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with thee into thine house, that he may eat bread and drink water. But he lied unto him. So he went back with him and did eat bread in his house and drank water. Now the man of God clearly knew the word of the Lord. He quoted it twice exactly to the king, and he quotes it again to this prophet. But the prophet lied to him saying, no, that's not, God might have said that, but he also said this. But God never contradicts himself. God never changes what his word says. So when there is times when we know what the word of God says, and somebody says, actually, you can do this and still be glorifying God, um, they're lying because it's going against what the word of God has said. And there's always punishment for disobeying the word of the Lord. If you look at verse 20, And it came to pass, as they sat at the table, that the word of the Lord came unto the prophet that brought him back, and he cried unto the man of God that came from Judah, saying, Thus saith the word of the Lord, 
For as much as thou hast disobeyed the mouth of the Lord, and hast not kept the commandment which the Lord thy God commanded thee, but camest back, and hast eaten bread, and drunk water in the place of which the Lord did say to thee, Eat no bread, and drink no water. Thy carcass shall not come unto the sepulcher of thy fathers. And it came to pass, after he had eaten bread, and after he had drunk, that he saddled for him the ass, to wit, for the prophet whom he had brought back. And when he was gone, a lion met him by the way, and slew him. And his carcass was cast in the way, and the ass stood by it, and the lion also stood by the carcass. And behold, men passed by and saw the carcass cast in the way, and the lion standing by the carcass. And they came and told it in the city where the old prophet dwelt. And when the prophet that brought him back from the way heard thereof, he said, It is the man of God who is disobedient unto the word of the Lord. Therefore the Lord hath delivered him unto the lion, which hath torn him and slain him, according to the, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake unto him. And he spake to his sons, saying, Saddle me the ass. And they saddled him. And he went and found his carcass cast in the way. And the ass and the lion standing by the carcass. The lion had not eaten the carcass, nor torn the ass. And the prophet took up the carcass of the man of God, and laid it upon the ass, and brought it back. And the old prophet came to the city to mourn and to bury him. The initial response somewhat is, this isn't fair. How is this old prophet that went and lied to this man able to go up there while the lion's still standing there, pick up his body, put it on his donkey, and take him back to the city without getting touched by the lion at all? He's the reason that the man of God turned aside, after all. But that's not fully true. But who, who was this prophet that is mentioned here? I think it'd be helpful to know, was this man, some people say that this prophet was malicious. He was angry at this man of God. And so he purposely knowing that he said, I can't eat here, lied to him to get him in trouble with the Lord. Others say that he's somebody that actually was a prophet of God and was sent specifically as a test. And still others have different ideas about him. Let's look at what some of the scriptures say about this um, prophet. He's called a prophet in 1 Kings 13.11. Um, but as you also look in 1 Kings 13.11, it shows that he let his sons participate in this idolatrous worship. It says, And now there dwelt an old prophet in Bethel, and his sons came and told him all the works that the man of God had done that day in Bethel. The words which he had spoken unto the king, them they told also to their father. So his sons were there at Bethel at the place of the worship of this false god. And his sons knew everything that the prophet, that, that the man of God had said to Jeroboam. And so they come and tell it to um, their dad. Um, so he knew exactly what the man of God had said about not being able to eat and drink there. He went out, and as you see in verse 18, he specifically did deceive the man of God. It says, but he lied unto him. And he lied in a very blasphemous way, saying that the Lord said this. Furthermore, um, if you look in 2 Chronicles chapter 11, so me 2 Chronicles chapter 11. This prophet that lived in Bethel, did not fully seek and love the Lord his God. In verse 13, it says, And the priests and the Levites that were in all Israel resorted to him, this is speaking of Rehoboam, resorted to him out of all their coasts. For the Levites left their suburbs and their possessions and came to Judah, and Jerusalem, for Jeroboam and his sons had cast them off from executing the priest's office unto the Lord. And he, he ordained him priests for the high places and for the devils and for the calves which he had made. And after them, out of all the tribes of Israel, such as set their heart to seek the Lord, God of Israel, came to Jerusalem to sacrifice unto the Lord, God of their fathers. So they strengthened the kingdom of Judah and made Rehoboam the son of Solomon strong three years. For three years 
They walked in the way of David and Solomon. Everybody that was there to seek the Lord their God fully with their heart left Jeroboam. So this man is still choosing to live in Israel because he had not fully decided to seek the Lord his God. Additionally, God didn't choose him to speak to Jeroboam. If he was a prophet of God and he was able to be used by God, um, God would have probably used him instead of grabbing somebody from a different nation to come speak um, to King Jeroboam. However, um, it does seem that the man of God wasn't trying to be malicious. The, the prophet wasn't trying to be malicious toward the man of God. Um, you see him mourning when, this, when the man of God dies. Um, as you see in verse, um, uh, verse 31 and 32. Uh, and 30, starting 30. And he laid his carcass in his own grave, which was a big thing back then to lay somebody else's body in your family grave. That was a big sign of respect towards somebody. And he cried and mourned over him, saying, Alas, my brother. And it came to pass, after he had buried him, that he spake to his son, saying, When I am dead, then bury me in the sepulcher wherein the man of God is buried. Lay my bones besides his bones, for the saying which he cried by the word of the Lord against the altar in Bethel and against all the houses of the high places which are in the cities of Samaria shall surely come to pass. This man believed that, the, the prophet believed that the man of God truly was speaking the words of God. He's wanting his bones to be laid right next to this man's bones. And he's truly mourning and crying out for his brother as he calls him when he dies. I think that the main reason that the prophet had gone out was he had no fellowship at all with anybody that wanted to seek the Lord. I think that he was somebody that did, in a sense, want to know the Lord his God, but wasn't committed enough to go the extra mile to leave his possessions, to leave everything he had, and to seek the Lord. So he stayed. And just like Lot was vexed in his righteous soul, you see um, those angels came, and into his house, and Lot was the protector kind of of them. And immediately when the Sodomites come up, Lot, instead of saying, this is wrong, don't do anything, he gives an alternate sin for the Sodomites to commit. Um, in this way, this man of God, I think, this prophet, did somewhat want to know the Lord, but he wasn't committed enough to actually seek the Lord with his whole heart and leave to go to Jerusalem. So I don't think he's being malicious and trying to go after the man of God. But when it seems unfair that this man who is lying to the prophet, who brought him back to his house, who knew that if he brought him back, he would directly, help, getting him to directly contradict the word of the Lord, and yet he's not the one that's punished for this sin. It's the man of God who chose to disobey the word of the Lord. And you see this prophet actually gets it exactly right in 1 Kings 13, 26. And when the prophet that brought him back from the way heard thereof, he said, It is the man of God who was disobedient unto the word of the Lord. Therefore the Lord hath delivered him unto the lion, which hath torn him and slain him according to the word of the Lord, which he spake unto him. He doesn't say, Oh, this is the man of God that I lied to and brought back, and he just did what I told him to. He's saying, no, this is the man of God that was disobedient to the word of the Lord. When we know what God's word says, it doesn't matter what anybody else says. We follow the word of the Lord, because that's the only thing that is ultimately and always true. God always punishes sin in some way. Now, the Bible here doesn't represent or show us how this prophet was punished for his lying. I believe that in some way he was, because we know that God gives to every man you, what every man sows that he also reaps. You see Jeroboam, his sins end up destroying his family. His sins destroy the entire nation. And the sins cause the death of his son because of the way that he lived his life. Um, that is, that account is in verse 14, if you want to read about that later. But disobedience to God is always a choice. 
Nobody ever forces us to sin. Nobody ever can make us sin. It's something that we choose. If we sin, it is our choice. Do not accept blatantly invitations to sin. There was a blatant invitation to sin by Jeroboam. But the man of God said no to that. But then there was a sin um, that he, the man of God was coaxed into sinning by somebody saying, it's okay, it's godly to do this. And we'll have Christians within our culture saying, it's okay, it's godly to do this for things that are sin. Don't let somebody lie to you saying this is good if it goes against the word of God. And then finally, our own flesh will try to deceive us as much as it can. It will make excuses for sins, saying, it's okay to do this. God didn't really mean that, or that doesn't apply to this situation. The word of the Lord is always true, is always right, and it never changes. And sin always comes with consequences. So that challenges us to know the word of the Lord, because if we don't know it, we can't follow it. And then as soon as we know it, obey it fully, in every way possible. Father, we thank you that you have given us your word, that we can seek you and we can know you, and that we can, every time we have questions about what is true, we can go back into your word and seek it. I pray, Father, that we would all see the consequences of sin. Sin is never free. Sin always comes with consequences. Pray that we would all see that every time we sin, we are never forced. It is something that we choose to directly disobey you and your word. Give us the wisdom that we need um, to seek your face and to draw closer to you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.